Ehud, and though elsewhere, especially in the contributions of Yossi Bartal, it is clear that Israeli anarchists affirm Palestinian self-determination as well. They do not come with an agenda that they seek to impart to Palestinians. They do not arrive in a savior role. They only seek to assist an agenda that Palestinians themselves formulate. This self-limiting move within the anarchist agenda is crucial. But still, how are we to understand self-determination? And is it, in fact, more primary and finally distinct from the question of state structure or even whether or not to engage in a state formation project? It's my understanding that there's a difference between Palestinian resistance struggles that seek to exercise and establish self-determination and those that immediately assume that the form or mode of expression for self-determination is the establishment of a state. Gordon assumes that the paradox of Israeli anarchism and Palestinian political aspirations is that the former are against the state and the latter are for the state. He asks, I quote again, how anarchists who support the Palestinian struggle reconcile the desire of the majority of Palestinians for a state of their own with their the anarchist anti-statist principles. How can they support the creation of yet another state in the name of national liberation, which is the explicit or implicit agenda of almost all Palestinians, end quote. I find myself asking, why is it at this juncture that Gordon and others within the Israeli left don't actively consult the long and complex Palestinian debates on statehood? This seems especially important to do if Israelis want to be able to think about the regional conflict outside of their own national frame, and if they're also seeking to find sites of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. Surely the state-building practices of the current Fayyad government have been cause for debate and even schism within the Palestinian population. Some Palestinians argue, for instance, for a one-state solution, like Omar Barghouti and the late Edward Said, affirming a secular state for the region that does not discriminate on the basis of religious or ethnic belonging. And yet others, like Anan Ashrawi and sometimes Azmi Bashara, argue for a, a two-state solution, fearing a division of Palestine into Bandustans that would replicate the worst dimensions of South African apartheid. Bashara's view is actually more complex, since he not only argues for a radically egalitarian revolution within the so-called Israeli democracy, suggesting as well that the struggle against colonization, but he suggests as well that the struggle against colonization must be temporally distinct from any struggle for state formation. His view is clearly not the same as Arafat's promotion of a state-centered project in the early 1970s, and it is clearly different from the state-building efforts now undertaken by the Fayyad leadership um, in the Palestinian Authority. Indeed, a quite important dis dissertation has been written by Tariq Mukheimer called State Building Process, the Case of Palestine, which traces the reluctance of Palestinians to accept state structures in the 1920s and 30s, understanding them as colonial impositions and means by which foreign uh, states uh, seek to consolidate their colonial control. This same sentiment was clearly voiced, ironically, by Azmi Bashara in a television interview in Israel in June of 2009, which visibly scandalized the left Israelis seated on either side of him. And I quote, it is true there has never been a separate Palestinian state. This is Bashara. Like all Arab states, this is a colonial invention. There is only an Arab nation which Palestine was part of, end quote. Perhaps Bashar's most uh, relevant point here is that the struggle against colonization, which is for him the meaning of the struggle against occupation, has to precede any question of state formation and must be kept distinct from it. My colleague Samara Esmir builds on this thesis to argue that the means of struggle for Palestinians must be distinct from the political goal of achieving a state. Marwan Barghouti, the, the jailed senior member of Fatah, underscores the importance of rights. But note, the form of resistance he invokes relies upon a discourse of rights that are not exclusively tied to the legal apparatus of the state and are not, in fact, necessarily inscribed in any existing legal code. 
Something similar happens in Azmi Bashara's language when speaking about Palestinians with limited rights of citizenship within Israel. He remarks, <coughs> here's Bashara, Arabs are much more aware of their rights not only to eat <coughs> and have a home and teach their children, but, al but also their right to express their political views and not get shot for that as citizens of the state of Israel, not only as Palestinians. Some say that Arabs in Israel are hopelessly marginalized, both in Israel and in the Arab nation. We think that Palestinians who are living with the contradiction of being Arabs and Israeli citizens at the same time should turn it into an accelerator of development. This contradiction should become the source of the dialectic that pushes the Arab consciousness toward the most sophisticated consciousness, the most sophisticated understanding of national identity and of citizenship at the same time. A synthesis of Arab nationality and democracy would be the greatest gift we can give the Arab world. Well, I suppose many would say that that gift is have been be, being given time and again this spring. For Bashara, this is a, there's a strong sense that the struggle for self-determination is one with no clear terminus and no pre-established goal. He claims, I would like to see a long-term struggle that realizes that there is no just peace in the near future. But for that, you must have determined leadership consistent, not hasty, which does not waste to the sacrifices of its people in a short time, which means a change in the mode of struggle. Such a struggle would leave the Palestinian question open for a long time, a struggle that people can live with in their daily life, a struggle with the economy, a struggle with the society. That's what I would like to see. Or once again, Bashara, who regularly distinguishes self-determination from state formation, calls for, <coughs> I quote, a democratic channel to express self-determination. Occupation is violent. Occupation deprives the Palestinian people not only of self-determination, but the elementary right to plan their lives every day, the most banal details. <coughs> of course, um, at this point, Bashar is, um, in these quotations, he's focusing on ordinary acts of struggle, um, acts that happen within every day. At, at the same time, it's clear in the 2009 quotation that he sees Palestinians as part of a, an Arab nationality or an Arab nation. Um, and one might, of course, worry about such invocations of nationalism um, uh, when he claims that the only nationalism Palestinians have is an Arab one. But I want to suggest that whatever form this nationalism is, it's one that crosses existing territorial boundaries, is not produced or exemplified by a single state and seems to be practiced in ordinary, everyday life. He lays claim to tradition, community, shared forms of aspiration, including counter-status trends that the nation expresses here, including the important links between Palestinians and other Arab peoples. The nationalism that supports the nation state is not the same as the nationalism that brings people together who are stateless or who, or who are maintained in subordination or enforced exile. But that is a topic for another paper. Perhaps most important here is the claim of rights that a people may assert even when those rights are not granted by any positive law, and precisely when the positive law that does exist seeks to deprive those very people of those rights. My suggestion is that the right to self-determination, the right to plan one's life, the right to live free of fear or of being imprisoned or killed or sent into exile for one's political viewpoints, the right to mobility, even the right to find a mode of governance that would, ex that would be a democratic channel to express self-determination. Um, uh, all of these rights are conceived of as prior to a legal regime. In fact, in Bashar's discourse, it would seem that the exercise of a right is part of an open-ended struggle without a perceivable end. Is there any other way for the stateless to exercise rights than through a struggle that endeavors collectively to bring into being the very rights that it exercises? Such rights are not grounded in personhood, nor are they derived from natural laws. Indeed, they're not grounded in any form other than the one by which they are invoked and exercised. Their exercise is their ground. Of course, there are those who seek recourse to international law or human rights doctrine, 
Omar Barghouti's case for BDS is among the most important and influential of these. He claims that the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is the largest nonviolent Palestinian form of resistance, a way of insisting upon that Israel comply with international and human rights laws, um, precisely when existing nation states and international authorities flagrantly and tactically fail to enforce them. Reacting to the accusations um, of treason against Azmi Bashara, who was accused of being in conversation with Hezbollah during the uh, most recent um, bombing of Beirut uh, by Israeli forces. Um, and after his um, subsequent exile in Jordan, Ali Abu Nima, um, the editor of the Electronic Intifada, known for his concept of one country, distinguished from one state, uh, makes clear his differences from the prevailing state-building policy of the current Palestinian Authority. And I quote, In practice, this means that the Palestinian solidarity movement needs to fashion a new message that breaks with the failed fantasy of hermetic separation in national states. It means we have to focus on fighting Israeli racism and colonialism in all its forms against those under occupation against those inside and against those in exile. In practice, we need to start building a vision of life after Israeli apartheid, an inclusive life in which Israelis and Palestinians can live in equality, sharing the whole country. You'll note that this life of Israelis and Palestinians living in equality, sharing the whole country, is only possible after the dissolution of an apartheid regime understood as part of settler colonialism. If Sinn Féin's Gary Adam and hardline Northern Ireland Unionist leader Ian Paisley can sit down to form a government together, this is still Ali Abu Nima, um, and if Nelson Mandela and apartheid's National Party could do the same, nothing is beyond the realm of possibility in Palestine if we imagine it and work for it." End quote. Those forms of struggle are very often local and provisional. They rely on forms of non-governmental action that disrupt the course of routinized military intimidation. Rima Hamami, a sociologist at Birzeit University, articulates modes of resistance at the checkpoint among Palestinians that are relatively spontaneous and without hierarchical form, as when people from the community converge at the checkpoints forming networks of peddlers, workers, and even Israeli witnesses to checkpoint harassment. Hamami underscores that such networks can affect a change in consciousness. Interestingly, in her work on the formation of informal checkpoint communities, she cites Asaf Bayat's Street Politics, Poor People's Movements in Iran, published in 1998. <coughs> there he refers to the quiet encroachment of the ordinary. What is the quiet encroachment of the ordinary? It is the effect of slow daily practices on the part of the urban poor. Here I'm quoting, um, I'm quoting Hamami, quoting uh, Bayat. Um, uh, the urban poor who were able to slowly take over and remake areas of Tehran to meet their needs, end quote. These modes of relatively spontaneous and networked actions are something other than deliberative democracy or even collective forms of direct action. It was, in her view, a result of the, and I quote, everyday tactics of survival.